This is a great day. Um, for the 11 years I've been in Parliament, four times I have tabled the Canadian Environmental Bill of Rights. And today, uh, the bill will be up for debate for the second time. In the, in the first Parliament I was elected, around 2009, the bill actually survived the first vote of the House and a ruling by the Speaker when the Conservatives tried to shut my bill down. That's really something when the Speaker's ruling. And um, it went to committee. Sadly, in committee, um, both Liberals and Conservatives basically shredded the bill. Um, it came back for third reading, but then the Harper government fell. So I tabled it again in successive parliaments. I've tabled it twice in this parliament uh, because the drafters wanted to tighten it up and make sure it was current. And so the current bill, C-438, I will be debating for a final time uh, this afternoon. So what is Environmental Bill of Rights? Well, Environmental Bill of Rights legally extends the right to a healthy, ecologically balanced environment. And it confirms the duty of the Government of Canada to uphold their public trust duty to protect the environment. It amends the Bill of Rights to add environmental rights. And it extends a bundle of rights and tools to Canadians to hold the government accountable, to have a voice in decisions that impact their health and environment. It provides standing before courts and tribunals. And it extends the power to hold the government accountable on effective enforcement of environmental laws and to have a say in the review of laws and policies. So why is this Bill of Rights necessary? Well, Community, NGOs, Indigenous voices ha are critical to triggering action. In, the, in my experience as an environmental lawyer for 45 years before I was elected Parliament, I represented a lot of farmers, a lot of uh, First Nations, Métis, uh, environmental organizations before tribunals and hearings, and, and campaigned for stronger federal and provincial environmental laws. We would not have even the environmental laws and policies we have right now in this country were it not for the interventions of Canadians. And I can give you some examples. Uh, I worked along with a small grassroots group in Alberta to protect uh, Lake Wabam against the impacts of coal-fired power. And had I not intervened and volunteered my time for seven years, we would not have the only law in Canada that requires the capture of industrial mercury from coal-fired power. That's the largest source of industrial um, mercury in North America. Grassy Narrows, here we are, right? We still have not had governments intervene to protect the people of Grassy Narrows from the mercury contamination in the river. If that community had had a voice in decisions and how that pulp and paper mill was operated decades ago, and if they were told about the health impacts of putting that effluent into the river, in all likelihood we would not have the crisis we have today and the expense of cleaning up that river and protecting those people. Sarnia, right? How many times do the indigenous people neighboring Sarnia beg for the governments to intervene and start protecting them from the emissions of that sector? The oil sands, just this week in the Hill Times, we have uh, an article written by three chiefs in northern Alberta crying out for action to stop the federal and provincial government from approving the release of the water from the tar pounds, highly contaminated water with toxins, into the river. And has the is the government seriously considering this? Well, I'm hoping that they'll listen to the Indigenous people. Um, Gateway, TMX pipelines, why are those, those pipelines held up in both cases? Because the public and Indigenous communities' concerns and interests and rights were not heard and considered. So it's just good governance to extend environmental rights and give all Canadians a say in decision making. So who has endorsed, endorsed my bill? Well, some provinces and territories have enacted certain amount of environmental rights. There are some limited rights in federal law, but a lot of them were downgraded by the Harper government. The Liberals promised as soon as they were elected they'd strengthen federal environmental law. Here we are almost into the next election, and still we don't have any of those. Uh, C-69, as we speak, is being downgraded by the Senate. Uh, the proposals to improve our law on toxins, that report went out more than two years ago. The government has done nothing to table improved rights to the public. Interestingly, the side agreement to NAFTA, uh, the North American Agreement Environmental Cooperation, Actually, Canada actually committed in there, and some of the provinces who signed on, to deliver exactly the rights that are in my bill. So they echo exactly what was in the NAIC. 
Sadly, a lot of those rights are weakened in the USMCA. The United Nations Human Rights Council Special Rapporteur worked for a number of years on examining across the globe how many environmental rights there are. Interestingly, his report to the UN uh, Human Rights Council exactly mirrors the rights extended in my Environmental Bill of Rights. Over 90 nations have extended these rights through constitutions, laws, court rulings, international treaties or declarations. There is in existence the Aarhus Treaty, which actually calls on all, all countries who sign that to exercise and put in place these rights. Canada has chosen not to sign. Very recently, it was announced by the Suzuki Foundation through their Blue Dot Initiative, how many members of Parliament have signed on to their Environmental Rights Pledge. And I say to the members of Parliament in this Parliament, it's not enough just to sign and say you believe in it. You need to support my bill and actually put those into law. Last year, the federal Liberals at the convention passed a resolution endorsing my bill and calling on their government to put that in place. It's now in our federal NDP platform. Over 3,000 Canadians have so far signed petitions supporting my bill. Uh, Eco Justice Foundation, the David Suzuki Foundation, the Social Dust Justice Co-op of Newfoundland have all endorsed my bill. I welcome questions, and I'm looking forward to being able to debate the bill in the House today, and I am very much looking forward to seeing what the Liberal and Conservative Party have to say in response to my bill. Thank you. Hi, Linda. Um, you talked a little bit about um, Grassy Narrows. Um, could you speak in more detail? The, the, um, the UN Rapporteur will be uh, speaking shortly after you today. Um, could you talk a bit more in, uh, in more detail about how your bill would address uh, some of the issues that have been raised because of that? Thanks. Thanks very much for that question. I actually only just discovered uh, that that UN Rapporteur on Environmental Rights and Toxins is here in Ottawa. And I would love the opportunity to meet with him. I didn't have the chance to meet the other UN Rapporteur who came through Canada. And I'm not sure if anyone told him about my bill. And I'm sure that he would be delighted to know that I have tabled several times over a bill. The whole point of having environmental rights means that Canadians actually have a voice in decisions that may impact their health or environment. So way back when the decision was made to allow that industry on that river in that First Nation territory, what should have happened is that community should have been directly involved in the decisions about the locating of that facility and how they were going to deal with their emissions, what kind of toxins they were dealing with, how they would dispose of them. And so decades later, we're still waiting for governments to, to respond. Sad to say, um, it's probably next to impossible now to undo the damage that has been done to those people by mercury contamination. We have to remember that mercury is a neurotoxin. It is like the top of the list of dangerous toxins on the planet. When the federal government first enacted a Contaminants Act, and that was way before the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, they already had committed under that law that they would regulate mercury. To this day, the federal government have never regulated mercury and they have not regulated mercury from coal-fired power. So this is why Canadians need these rights stated in law, so that when the government comes forward and they decide that they're going to approve a project, when they decide that they're going to issue a law or a policy, support any kind of initiative. In fact, if you look at the Cabinet Directive, the Cabinet Directive, I think, has been in place since the, the mid-1990s. The Commissioner of Environment Sustainable Development in each one of her audits over the last decade has chastised every federal department and agency for failing to obey that cabinet directive. It requires all the officials and all the ministers when they're proposing any law, policy or program to ensure that they take a look at environmental impacts and sustainability. And I'm looking forward to the new President of the Treasury Board to be finally delivering on that responsibility. That, that's one small step. So environmental rights can be extended in many ways. Um, I actually fought with the drafters because they wanted to pare down the bill and just extend the rights but not include the duties. And my argument was, having talked to environmental litigators, is you actually have to have the duty there so that you can seek an order of mandamus so that they have to deliver on that responsibility to extend those rights. Um, it would be nice if this wasn't necessary, but government after government have failed to recognize the right of communities to have a say in any kind of programs or projects that might impact their health and environment. Yeah, and you, you, you mentioned uh, you tabled twice in, parliament, in this parliament. For, oh, in this parliament, uh, yes. Right, and, and, and 
can you talk a bit about what, 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 what are your feelings now after having gone through this process a few times? Well, I wish that I could have debated it the second time that I tabled the bill, but as you know, it's a lottery. And so to tell you the truth, I didn't even think in this parliament I would have a chance to debate the bill. Um, I'm actually delighted that I'm going to have a chance today to, again, support my bill. And I'm delighted that uh, the other parties are going to have to stand up in the House and say what their opinion is. Um, given the fact that a good number of those members of Parliament, uh, incredibly a huge array of Liberal members of Parliament, have signed that environmental pledge, I'm looking forward to seeing what are they going to say about my bill. And I would have been delighted if the last uh, two governments, the Conservative and Liberal, had taken my bill and enacted a whole environmental bill of rights like Ontario had. But uh, the, the governments and the ministers have chosen not to. Um, so what my, my private member's bill is a place card. It gives the framework. It's now endorsed globally as the way to go forward. And um, nobody's going to be happier than me then if everyone puts this in their platform, it's clearly already in our platform. I don't just want it in a platform. I want governments to commit starting uh, late October next year. Let's table that as the first bill. Is that, is that um, something that you're anticipating? You talked about the Liberals with the, um, the passing the resolution of the convention. Are you anticipating them? <laughs> one including? would think so. One would think so. But uh, one can't predict. Um, I'm... I actually asked one of the, uh, the Liberal members. One of the Liberal members actually worked with me the first time I drafted my bill. Um, he came from Ecojustice. And I asked him to be one of the 20 um, seconders of the bill, and he refused. So I don't know who the Liberals are going to choose to speak to my bill today. And I am going to be very interested to hear what they have to say. You know, they can choose to say, oh, it's a, it's a great, great idea, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, too bad it isn't time to, to go to committee. They may say, well, it could have been, but it's got a few flaws. I'm hoping they just come out and say, we absolutely are behind this bill, and we think that the next parliament uh, should put these rights in place. And I'd love to hear the Conservatives say that as well. So far, far the cons four of the Conservatives have signed. I think all of the bloc has, um, both of the Greens. So uh, here's hoping we get a government after the next election that's going to put this high in their priorities. Um, I got another question. On, you, t you talked about the, uh, the rights being diminished in the new NAFTA. Yes. Uh, could you outline what, what are the differences? I had the privilege of working at the uh, secretariat that was established under the environmental side agreement to NAFTA. And uh, that organization has done incredible work. And, and what that side agreement does is a number of things. It establishes a council of environment ministers. Um, over time, uh, the governments of all three countries have diminished that and had lower level officials dealing with that. Um, under the original agreement, um, citizens could file a submission calling for investigation into failed enforcement. That's completely gone. Uh, under the former agreement, every country was supposed to have a national advisory council on whether or not they're living up to those environmental rights under that agreement. That's gone. Um, in all of the trade agreements that have been signed since NAFTA, both under the Conservatives and under the, under the Liberals, they have diminished uh, the strength of those provisions. Um, as I recall, President Clinton, under, he promised that he said that was our mistake. Uh, both the labor, labor and environmental agreements were merely side agreements and by and large not binding. He had said when we go forward, if we ever renegotiate this agreement, they should be within uh, the trade agreement itself and the government held, held accountable. Um, sadly, it's still just a side agreement. My other concern is... At the table for negotiating uh, the new NAFTA agreement, there were no environmental officials or people from civil society advising. Late in the day, really late in the day, uh, Minister McKenna put together a little advisory group. There's no way of knowing if it had, had any say. Environment, you know, they talk a big line and they say we have to balance economic development and environmental protection, but you're not seeing the strength of the environmental protection. You know, it's very, very down on the scale.